I guess we're okay. Recording has started. All right. So we'll get, we'll kind of jump right in here, everybody, since we have a, a packed agenda. I was joking earlier that tonight is the Alex show because he's both presenting our deep dive <clears throat> and uh, talking through the details of fermentation. Um, both of those presentations are in the Facebook and I'll be moving them over to the G drive later today or tomorrow. Um, so just a few quick announcements and then we'll, we'll kind of dive right in. Um, so first off, thanks to everyone who brewed the smash beer. I think there was a total of seven of us. <clears throat> um, I think most of us were able to drop off the beers and pick them up today. So cheers to that. We'll talk about uh, those in a little bit and we'll try and do something similar for future meetings. Um, if you had signed up for the BJCP class, you may have saw the email uh, that we have moved that to be virtual for the fall starting hopefully um, the first week of October um, on a Monday or a Tuesday night. <clears throat> uh, Mike Burry will be hosting that uh, virtually via Zoom and then there will be an in-person test um, in December hopefully um, and we'll figure out the logistics of that. So the cost is $100 um, it used to be $200. We've cut the cost since we're not having to buy the beer and you're going to have to still uh, buy your own beer um, at home for the tasting and for the scoring. Um, and then the rest of the fees will go towards the cost of an off flavor kit. Uh, there will be an off flavor, <coughs> off flavor class where he'll doctor everything and find a way to distribute that um, to everybody um, as well. If you have any questions about that, email me or shoot me a message. Um, we have a deadline, kind of a loose deadline if you haven't signed up by tomorrow. We've done that mainly just so we can get a gauge of how many people are interested before we open it up to other clubs and other um, interested parties. So um, I think that's it from a BJCP perspective. The COVID cup, I will take the hit on this one. We are behind in getting that off the ground. That is uh, totally my fault. I've been slacking for the last month, um, just been busy with work and other stuff and just have not had a chance to coordinate with the judges um, to make that happen. <clears throat> but I promise I'm going away in two weeks and I will get it figured out before I'm gone <laughs> um, so that we can get that moving. Um, and my apologies for for the delay there for those who are still interested in entering. It's just been, um, you know, just a little busier than I thought the last few weeks and I just haven't had the time to make that happen. Um, but we will re-gauge who's still interested and get that, um, get that out there. So, and I think, I don't, I'm short on announcements this, this month, but stay tuned if we miss you towards the end of this meeting. Um, October's meeting, we have Omega Yeast joining us, one of the owners and founders um, of Omega Yeast for all the Quebec fans out there. They'll be joining us to talk all things Quebec, Kavik, Kavik, however you say it, um, and, uh, you know, get some good question and answers in there on all their yeasts and, and what they do. So I'm looking forward to that as I just brewed my first beer with the <clears throat> Quebec yeast last weekend and it fermented out in three days at 90 degrees. So um, very cool. All right. So with that, unless there's any questions, um, I'll pass it over to you, Alex. And why don't we start with um, the Oktoberfest and fest beers and then go into fermentation. All right, uh, let's see if I can do the screen share thing. Uh, you know, I have trouble with this sometimes. Oh yeah, with those protections, yeah. Uh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. Is my oh, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, this happened last time, hold on. Yeah. This is, we're using the new uh, bomb account. We're no longer using my <coughs> uh, work account, so hold on. Okay, try again. Okay. Is that sharing? I see a black screen. I have the thing up. My 
screen sharing's paused. Let's using enhanced equipment. Resume share. Nothing, huh? No. Um, let's see what these things are. No, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, any buttons here that are going to enable this to work? So I, I will share. If you want it. <clears throat> Give me one second. This might be something on my end because I sometimes have problems sharing my screen and other platforms. Are you seeing it now? I'm seeing a black screen also. There it is. Hooray. Okay, right. get the show on the road. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Um, so Oktoberfest Mertzen beer, this is a, a rather simple tasting style, so the flavor notes are going to be pretty much almost one flavor. Uh, but, you know, just to dive into a little bit of it, we're all familiar with the uh, Oktoberfest held in Germany the last couple of weeks of September, which I guess is a sense of humor. Um, and the original party, you know, started with a wedding, right? Um and it was a royal wedding. You know, they opened it up. They gave away beer to the public. Everybody liked that so much. They wanted it to happen every year. Not a surprise. But it's also coincidental with some other events that are going on, some things that uh, preceded the wedding. Um, and, you know, it may not have been any special beers uh, released, or it may have been. You know, there was certainly fall harvest festivals all over the world, you know, when the harvest comes, and it definitely coincides with that timing in Germany. Um, and it also coincides with something that the monks used to do in caves, and this gets to the roots of, you know, the fest beers being lager beers, is that they would age, they would actually put up beer in March, age it over the summer in the caves, and then release it, you know, about this time of year at the fall festivals. And so, you know, what you have here is sort of a a super party going on where you have all of these threads of celebration that come together and, and, and make the Oktoberfest a big party. Um, naturally, uh, there are other things involved here because there's a very specific flavor profile that comes with this beer. And this goes to a brewer from Vienna, uh, Anton Dreyer, and he actually was uh, someone who got together with a brewer in Munich called uh, George Settlemeyer. The two of them are responsible for revolutionizing uh, the beer industry in Germany uh, in the early 19th century, late 18th century. In, in the early 18th century, England was really the, the, the best brewer of beer. Um, they, had, they had entered into their industrial revolution. They had learned how to do uh, brewing on a massive scale under great control, and they were the envy of the world, and these guys were jealous. They actually went to England to learn the techniques and then came back home and began to apply the techniques. Um, and on top of that, this is really a Pilsner beer story or a lager beer story. Somehow, they got the lager yeast from the monks in Munich. And it is, there are stories around that, but you know, generally it comes down to uh, a bribe of a monk or something like that to bring the beer out of the cave, the, the, the yeast out of the cave so that they could brew with it. Even though they didn't know exactly what the yeast was, there was a slurry that they needed to make lager beers. And from that point on, Pilsners and, and all of these other lager beers uh, came out to um, dominate the brewing industry, you know, when that sort of escaped from the Munich caves. Um, let's try the next slide and see what I have there. Sean? There he is. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll describe the style a little bit. Um, you know, the, the, this beer is a lot like other lagers. It's going to have a very clean flavor profile. So words like crisp and refreshing are always part of it. Uh, but this particular beer is very malt leaning, right? Um, it's going to be dominated by the malt flavor, 
and the hops are really only there to make sure the malt flavor doesn't taste sweet. Uh, so this is kind of, you know, what the style's all about, you know, the, the Munich malts. Um, a lot of the flavor descriptions I've read include the word soft in, in, in the way this thing approaches your palate. So those of you who have your bomb packs convenient to you uh, might taste the beer and see if you agree with that, um, that there's a softness to it. This is one of those ambiguous terms, you know, that kind of winemakers use, and I'm not exactly sure how you how how to make that an objective term, but it, it's just it, it lays easy on the palate. Let's say um, it's unlike beers that are made with um, harder waters, like the Dortmunder style pilsners and things like that, which generally have a lot more harshness to them. Um, but you know the signature profile, of signature flavor of this is the flavor of the Munich malt, which anybody who like eats dry Wheaties or dried bran uh, cereals out of the box will recognize the flavor of this beer immediately because that is what it tastes like, those those things. Um, and it's generally, you know, the balance is bitterness and it's dry. Um, so, you know, I'm emphasizing these topics because a lot of American microbrewers, at least back in the day that I was brewing, uh, made an error in their formulations, and they wanted the beer to be sweet because they felt it was malty, and malty equals sweet. And this is not the case with the beer. This is a very drinkable beer. You shouldn't feel like you know you have all this cloying flavor in your mouth. Um, of course, this is a beer style which is almost the opposite of the saison. Uh, so I made that clear in the inflexible aspects there. So. You know, Germans are very particular about specific things that they're doing, and this beer is no exception. Uh, it's got to be in the Munich style of, of, of malts. Um, these are malts that are dried at a high temperature. They're Pilsner malts, but instead of drying them at the lowest possible temperature to get the color, you're drying it at a higher temperature. And this is very different than the way you would, say, make a crystal malt or caramel malt, because a caramel malt is actually a malt that is remashed and then dried at a high temperature after that. And what you get are caramelized sugars from the mash. Um, it decreases the yield, um, and actually in both cases the yield is decreased by the higher temperatures. So, you know, with the Munich malts, you are killing some enzymes. The, the Munich malt itself is barely able to digest the sugars that are in uh, but you have to use it, and it has to be like the dominant malt that's in there. Maybe I'll be talking about this on the next slide. The other aspect of it is with the hop variety, you know, you got to have a clean hop flavor, um, and that's coming mainly from your continental hop varieties, uh, mainly the Holler Tower, I think, um, in the Munich beers. And so that's the, that's the hop you're looking for, um, and it's just going to be there to provide just enough bitterness. You're not looking for hop aroma, really, or, or hop flavor. You just want a very clean, low bitterness. And, you know, these, quote, aroma hops, which are low alpha, will often, you know, they, they have less of the cohomulones and such that give you the, the, all of these off flavors as well. So they give you much cleaner beers. And so those are the ones you should be striving for. Um, trying to remember now um, what the American version of the Holla Tower is. Is that the hood hops or something like that? I think... Uh, those are hops that, you, you know, you might want to substitute. But once again, no flavor. Um, and just the, the reminder that, you know, these are not sweet beers. And the category is at the bottom of the page, so you can always look it up. Uh, I, I derived a lot of these comments from the BJCP guidelines. So in the next slide. Okay, so here's what you're doing. You've got your yeast, which is a lager yeast. Time out. Um, and you've got a unique water chemistry. Um, the Munich water profile is, is a bit high in carbonates. These are what you call temporary hardness. And, you know, a lot of brewers try to replicate the water coming into breweries um, and, and to replicate the style. But I think if it's high in carbonates, you're going to have problems with creating that softness in the beer. Um, so there are ways to soften the carbonates from the water. One of them is to pre-boil it. 
you know, you boil it, and some of the carbonates are released as carbon dioxide, and you reduce the carbonate content. So that's why it's called temporary hardness, because you can get rid of it. Um, the other thing you can do is you can acidify your mash with calcium chloride, um, but you want to keep the calcium higher than the sulfates um, in this, and that also helps to reduce the harshness of the beer, that you want to have a smoother beer. Uh, calcium is always very important for stabilizing the enzymes in the mash, and so especially because you're going to have problems getting yield with Munich malts, you know, you might want to be adding calcium to acidify the mash and to stabilize the enzymes. So here's where we get into the specifics of the malt. Um, you can use Vienna malt for part of the charge. It's made with the same technique as Munich malt. It's just not dried at quite as high a temperature. Uh, but these are both derived from Pilsner malt. Uh, which is short for the Moravian malt varieties that are made in, in Czechoslovakia. And, you know, these malts are also known for being a little bit under-modified. So usually when you see Moravian malt in a, in, in a bill, you, you want to be doing decoction, but most of us don't do decoction, and I don't highly recommend it. Uh, I'll just deal with the slightly lower yield that I get from the under-modified under malt. Um, as I, yeah, so I think I, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit before talking about diastatic power. Vienna malt has enough diastatic power to digest, you know, other, so all the starches and so a little bit of adjunct too. Uh, but it doesn't have quite the depth of color that you get, want from the, the Oktoberfest. So, you know, you need to use a little bit of a couple of, you know, darkness levels of Munich. And they're just dried at higher and higher temperatures to get deeper and deeper color. Um, and so you can use those at varying degrees to achieve your, your overall color and flavor profile. Um, there's really not a lot of special mashing going on if you, if you want to do a single step or a two step infusion. Protein rest, I like protein rests because, you know, you get the nice rocky head out of it. Um, but, you know, you also have a sacrification rest. You want to do it a little bit higher to get a little bit more body on this beer. This beer is not like a, a thin beer. It's got some body. Those of you who have your Oktoberfest with you may give a slug now and, just, and think about the body of the beer um, and, and see what you think. Uh, it's generally, it's not the heaviest beer you ever had, but it's certainly not the lightest. Okay, next slide then. So the vital stats come directly from the, the definition. Um, Hypothetic recipes, uh, I really, to tell you the truth, because I am not a lager brewer at home, although I successfully made a Pilsner this winter, I have not made an Oktoberfest beer yet, but that's going to change this winter. And my recipes looking basically like the whole grain recipe, where it's going to be half the animal, and then it's going to be a quarter each of the light and the dark Munich malt. And that's where I got my final color of, you know, six lava bond, 12 SRM from, those are calculations that come from, from those colors of the malts. Um, the final gravity is a little bit higher because it's got the more body in it. Um, partial mashing, you, you, know, you can use some of the dark Munich malts to uh, really accentuate some of the flavor. But there really is, you know, and this is where the extract malt brewers kind of are at a disadvantage, there really no, is no way to get that unique grain flavor profile from a malt extract because they're not – they're not using music, Munich malts to make that extract. So, so you really need to do at least a partial mash to, to get that flavor. And I, I like, you know, out of this, you know, to balance the beer that I've, I've created here, uh, 21 IBUs should be enough. Um, the starting gravity is going to be somewhere around 1055, 1056. There it is. I put it up. Good. All right. I thought ahead. So. And then, of course, the last thing is, you know, there is an Oktoberfest Merz and Lager that's going to be showy for the malts, and that's the one you want, at least, you know, White Labs has the WLP 820. I didn't look up the Y yeast one. I'm sure they have the same yeast under a different name. Any questions? Any suggestions? No. That's it. All right. So, so then, yeah, so there's commercial examples, obviously. These are the ones that are available in, in, in the U.S. I think the Iyengar is the, is the most perfect expression of the Oktoberfest beer. So I made sure that Alex put it in the bomb packs. So those of you who are drinking the Iyengar, this is the one where you're going to get that Wheaties flavor the clearest. So, so that's the Oktoberfest you want. 
I dig the dark air, the amber color of the beer. It's a beautiful, clean beer. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that there aren't other good ones. Certainly some of the other Munich varieties, the Paul Honor and the Hawker Shore are good. And I don't know where Stout stands, but they, they made a really good Oktoberfest beer as well. And, and, and they really stick to German traditions when they make their beers. And so they do a good job with all their German-style beers. Um, I am not familiar with the Cape May Oktoberfest that you got in the bomb pack. Um, I will be familiar with the Bitburger and the Vian Stefan are momentarily. Uh, but, you know, those are also, you know, the Vian Stefan is also near Munich and the Bitburg is, is southern Germany, but not, not quite Munich. So they should do a good job of it. Anyway. One, that's Oktoberfest beers. I hope you guys are enjoying it. I'm not seeing a lot of nods out there. Yeah, Chloe's giving me the nod. David's giving <laughs> me the nod. All right. <clears throat> Dave's got the, the Cape May going. All right, excellent. All right, that's a warm up. Uh, we could take a quick break, and then I guess Sean's going to have to like get the uh, the next set of slides going. Uh, thanks for doing. That. Yeah, I've had um, had the Michigan. Does copper. anyone else have? That was pretty good. Uh, really interesting flavor profile, and then I also had uh, really Rich's Azaka, which I'm having right now. That was pretty good too. So. Um, doing the smash beer is super interesting. It's an awesome opportunity to really try, like, for instance, never had Michigan copper before or even had a Zaka by itself. Um, so I'm really grateful for everyone that did brew these and were able to share them because it's a great learning experience. Yeah, I've noticed in tasting riches and having tasted In mine because we both used a Zaka very different than mine. Um, I'll be interested in those two because I don't know if it's the malt difference that is giving some of the flavor differences or, or um, just even some of the, you know, how we hopped as well. But, and mine is not as, as bright and as clean as your guys' uh, beers are. Mine's still a little hazy, but I think that's because I only put it in the key like two days ago and kind of force carved them by um so i'm thinking i just didn't have enough time for mine to clear out completely what were your uh, initial thoughts on the nelson i thought it was pretty interesting how grassy it was and bell peppery especially the first couple sips kind of made me like take a step back i've never had that hop like obviously by itself before so it's definitely pretty weird pretty interesting but i'm curious yeah. what, you know your what what you got from it well you know because i've apparently i'm drunk and i've already been drinking everyone saying i've not been able to control the slides uh, no i like <laughs> it it was definitely different and having it by itself and you know kind of isolate it was you know kind of not very much i think i'm freezing up here Yeah, to, to follow up on the Nelson Sauvin hops, I mean, it, you know, there's a lot about those hops that give you flavor profiles that are very similar to Sauvignon Blanc, actually. Hey guys, hold on. Why they name it that way. So it can get that fruity caddy kind of um, Talk amongst yourselves for a second. Yeah, it definitely had a very strong wine character through the hop, which I thought was really cool um i knew that's like what they're selling through like the name but i was really surprised that that much character would come through through just the hop itself (laughs) 
Yeah, I think as Sean was trying to say, it's nice to be able to take these, uh, all of your different varieties and isolate them and get a real taste of what's going, what they're each contributing. So, so the smash brews are definitely useful for that. So. Was the uh, smash brew, because I, I didn't see all of that, was the smash brew, everybody was working with the Southern hops, or um, did everybody get to choose, like, one varietal of malt and one varietal of hop to use and, you know, just investigate on their own ingredients that they wanted to understand? We used uh, the, the two-row malt. Um, but I went to Philly Homebrew because they had a kiln, a rustic version of it that was supposed to have a little more flavor. So, uh, but it was still two row. And then I had gotten some uh, other hops. So I used Michigan copper hops in my smash. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know if anybody in the club does this, but, you know, there's some people back in the early days used to like to uh, take their malts and roast them in the oven to generate flavor a little bit, you know, to darken their malts. Um, it's it's really hard to control. You don't know what you're going to get, but, you know, you're definitely going to add some flavor there by doing that. The very first beer that I ever made uh, was a stout and the homebrew supply store didn't have black patent. So we just got like, I don't know, like, I think it was, it was probably just crystal malt and we just roasted it in the oven and then threw it in <laughs> to get our color. Yeah. If you got a coffee roaster, you know, you just throw your malt in there, you know, you just, it's going to taste the same anyway. Right. So yeah, roast it up in that. I mean, we, we used a cookie sheet in the broiler. We just put it in the broiler in the oven. I had a, I had a question about the, um, you know, leaving, leaving the beer on, on uh, yeast too long. How long is too long? Is there anything you look for to uh, kind of kind of gauge that? Uh, yeah, so yeast with high alcohol tolerance will do better that way um, and, and high temperature tolerance. Uh, both of those are things that will kill the yeast, uh, alcohol and temperature. So if, if you want to hold a beer for longer, look for the high alcohol tolerance and the high temperature tolerance and, and it will help you a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I mean, homebrew, a year or two in the bottle, depending on the temperature, uh, you know, you're going to get some autolysis, you're going to get some bad flavors, you know, it's not to be helped uh, under these circumstances, unless you're going to age it cool, but then you're going to need a longer time period. So you're still going to get them if you're going to go five years, you know, you should probably refrigerate them, and then, but you're going to develop your aging flavors that you want slower. So it's a game, right? Um, there's no rules, and, you know, it all depends on the yeast, what it's going to do uh, when you age it. Okay. That, I mean, that's good to know. It's not, it's not like if, uh, if I can't get to my brew one week, you know, to, to go off to category or secondary, that it's going to be a concern. You know, one week, two weeks, that doesn't sound like it's going to be that big of a deal. Now we're talking on a scale of months to years here. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, just to, to start things up there, only a couple of people have been talking about the smash beers. Uh, what did some of the other people who haven't contributed on that point uh, been thinking about their smash beers? Anything come as a surprise to you or, you know, you didn't get to it yet? Uh, what's going on out there in the smash world? I have to say, uh, you know, the two people that wound up doing the same hop, I really liked comparing those. That was that was really interesting. I um I haven't been drinking a lot of these because I'm actually on a work call at the same time. So that's the best time to be drinking when you're on a work call, right? I've only had half of the six pack. <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember, a blood alcohol content of 0.075 is when you're the most creative. So you should be in the meeting just below the drunken tolerance that, that's where you're going to be the most creative no so so far i've had the uh i've had the uh nelson Sauvon uh that jack made and then i believe i had both of the uh azakas and uh really getting especially off of sean's uh really getting that that vegetal green, you know, by itself, it's not necessarily pleasant, but as part of a, you know, as part of a bigger, uh, a, you know, a, a more mixed hop schedule, a, you know, a more rounded beer that could do really well now. Yeah, well, this is the benefit of doing the smash. I mean, you know, these are things that you probably wouldn't use for like the whole beer you know, on a regular basis, but, you know, now you know what it's bringing to the table. So when you want to formulate a recipe and do 10% this or 20% that, you know, these smash brews are great to give you like some sort of mental baseline. So you know how you want to blend these flavors, you know, but, you know, like most wine varietals too, you know, there, there's always a hole in the flavor um, that, that makes the mm -hmm. pure varietal kind of weak. And so it's nice to blend your wines, and the same with your hops. It's nice to blend your hops as well. um, you can get a better flavor profile by doing it. Yeah, I really like I really like the smashes for that, and then seeing you know even within even within the uh, you know the restriction of or the um, guidelines of you know. Um, Try to keep it to two row, you know, whatever the two row is, one hop, and then, you know, uh, SO4. Mm -hmm. it, it's a great, great, great time, great way to uh, compare all of these. All right, I'm back. Hopefully, I don't know if everyone is, can hear me or not. Yeah. We can hear you. Your CompuServe account is working well. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling them that I'm definitely, I moved my office around, and I think by moving the laptop to the far end of the house, my Wi Fi signal is being impacted. So I have a feeling I had two work calls today where I had issues and now I'm convinced that that is what's happening. So apologies for the confusion here. You gotta I'm going to stay of off extra, video. For that. Go ahead. Extra Sorry. Hamsters in the signal booster there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm on to my third smash beer. That will make everything feel better. There you go. With all this. I want to say, is Jack still here? Um, it looks like he might have left. But yeah, he, I love the – his. Uh, John put – here, I'll turn on the video just so everyone can see what he put on his bottles. It's like the entire recipe. Wow is on the bottle so it has 
Canton tablets, 11 pounds of base malt, Irish moss, Motika. Mo, you know, when he put the Motika in, 15 minutes. He steeped it at 20 minutes, two ounces. He dry hopped an ounce. So it kind of gives every step by step process. He had 1.05 wart chillers. 1.05 <laughs> wart chiller, yeah. I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> I don't know what that what that means. Is that is that that's the one you're drinking right now? That's what I've just opened, yep. All right. And I think both Jack and John and I, we all use the proximity malt. Um, so all three of us use the same and his looks like mine, a little cloudy. Jack's was like crystal clear. Um, his is a little, is a little cloudier. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm sad now not to have been doing these um, in parallel, you know, small pours for each one because, man, Jack's, I could, I could just go for that any day now. Um, but I think that that in remembering that beer, it didn't have the same ooh, hoppy uh, expression that everything else has had since then. Yeah, it was a good it was a good beer, but it was very inoffensive. Which actually, for did he do Vic Secret? Yeah. No, he did Nelson Sauvin. Yeah. Nelson. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this Motika, it's really, it really stands out. It's, it's very different than all the others so far. How would you describe it, Sean? What characteristics? It's got like a citrusy, um, it's a little sharp. That's like, it's very, it's, the bitterness is a little sharp. Um, I'm trying to place the other flavor. It's like there's a little bit of citrus. There's a little bit of grassiness, <clears throat> like a little bit of – it's not your typical, like, pine type of hop or, you know, floral. It's very – I don't know. It's very different than what I was expecting. I'm trying to place – let me see something here. Hold on. I want to look up Motika now to see what I should be tasting because I don't, I'm not sure what I'm tasting. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, see, I would say so far this is very similar. This is most similar so far to yours. Um, well, it's, I'm having the Sterling Pig Cider that they just uh, debuted. Hmm. It tastes like TV static. You mean the seltzer? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Can't say I'm a fan. Fresh tropical limes. Adjust your antenna, Andy. Uh, I don't know any amount of tuning is going to make this better. It's... That flavor they chose was not great. Hibiscus. Is that... it's, it's not unpleasant. It's definitely not like, but it's definitely not beer. It has that the, the flavor profile is it's about as flat as a cutting board. It's it's very very. There's not a lot there, not a lot of depth, not a lot of anything. I mean, it's a seltzer. What would you expect? Yeah, I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> I literally didn't know what to expect. So figured I'd try it. You know, Julie wanted to try it, so I. That's why I got it, and I figured oh, I'll have one now, and uh, kind of regretting that decision. So, so Sean, fresh, fresh lime. I get that. Yeah, I was just looking at that, and now I'm like, that's citrusy. Yeah. Maybe that's why I couldn't place it because I was thinking like orange, and you know, typical hoppy citrus, but it's a lime, you know, <clears throat> zesty bitterness, like 
it's very different than other hops I've had. If you right, if you think citrus and hops, you're going grapefruit and lemon. You know, maybe you're right. not going lime, but that's what this is. Yeah. And then uh, what do they say? Rosemary and and uh, basil. You know, I don't see that in my description, but I could totally get that. It, it is very herbal in that aspect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying. It's, you know, it's not that it's a bad beer. It's just the, the by itself. It would be better in something like something more Belgian or we just as a different flavor. Heard practically none of it. He gets a good picture though. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> I'm tired of this damn internet. <clears throat> you know, you know, Sean, we could hook you up with like a telegraph wire that would just go to everyone's house and you could like type out, you know, did da did da did da did da did da you know, just do it that way. We could uh, we could bring up a couple of kegs with a string, right? I'm gonna download some beer off the internet. I'm so glad I'm not the most technically challenged anymore. I'm just I think sorry. Sean just won. <laughs> <laughs> Get an Aldous lamp. <laughs> I'll just start writing everything down. Well, I'll lean out the window and look. All right. Like, well, I guess um, I know we've lost a few people, but yeah. <laughs> but I'll stop. Let me stop the recording because I feel like we have we have finished the official part of this.